Okay, everyone. Um, good morning and uh, welcome to the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce's Infrastructure and Land Use Committee. Uh, I am Ryan Levine. I'm Vice President of Government Affairs for the Chamber. And this morning, we're really pleased to have a great special guest who uh, will be introduced. It's Chris Conklin from the Montgomery County Department of Transportation. And before we get to Chris, I wanted to say that we're recording this meeting, uh, as we do for all of our committee meetings. And, uh, you know, just a, a quick advertisement for our next committee meeting. Um, uh, the, the meeting is May 10th at 830 a.m. And that guest is going to be Chuck Bean, who's executive director of MCOG, the Maryland, the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. Uh, Chuck's going to discuss MCOG's work with um, Metropolitan Washington, including their planning framework project that focuses on um, equity, housing, climate, and high capacity transit. So. Um, that, that should be extremely interesting. Again, that, that meeting is May 10th and you should see some invites. Um, if you haven't seen anything, you should see some invites going out this week. So stay tuned for that, but that's just to save the date. Um, and before we get to our um, co-chairs, I wanted uh, everyone uh, on the call to uh, introduce themselves if they would to, to our speaker, Chris Conklin. Um, again, I'm Brian Levine with the uh, Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce. Um, Maybe Charlie, you can go first. You're at the top of my screen. Couldn't hear. We couldn't hear you before, Charlie. Are you hold on, let me see. Let me find your face. Go ahead, Charlie. Charlie is having some audio problems, um, so I will introduce him. <laughs> this is Charlie Scott from Lamada and uh, my longtime friend. Um, Mel, why don't you go next? Uh, this is Mel Toll with Lee Development Group. Did you hear me? Yeah. I did hear you. Thank you, Mel. Great. I think it'd be appropriate maybe next for our chair, Lowell Yoder, to introduce himself. Morning, uh, Lowell Yoder. I manage the corporate banking group for M&T Bank. Thank you, Lowell. Andy? Uh, Andy Bridge, Senior Vice President, Equal Bank, uh, Business Development Director. Thank you, Andy. Um, hi, Leslie. Good morning, everybody. Leslie Weber, Johns Hopkins and Suburban Hospital Community and Government Affairs. Okay. Um, my apologies. Uh, Stuart, go ahead and introduce yourself, Stuart. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Stuart Barr. I'm a land use and zoning attorney with the law firm Lurch, Early and Brewer in Bethesda. Thank you, Stuart. Mr. Carroll. Good morning, everyone. Chris Carroll, External and Legislative Affairs with AT&T, uh, replacing Latar Harris, who I'm sure you all worked with uh, prior. She took a promotion and another opportunity in uh, Philadelphia, but glad to be here. Thank you, Chris. Beth, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Beth Perlman, marketing consultant uh, based in Rockville and saw the, the notice for this meeting and the, the uh, I think the chamber email I'm on. Thank you, Beth. A few more. Emily. Hi, a strategic communications manager for MCGOT. I'm just listening in today. Thank you, Emily. Maria. This is Maria Margarita Celaya. I am a citizen from Bethesda, Maryland. Thank you, Maria. And last but not least, um, Amanda. Morning. Thank you, Brian. Hi, Amanda Allen, Government and Community Affairs Manager for Transurban. Hi, Amanda. I was hoping you would join us this morning. Okay. Um, without further ado, let me hand it over and introduce our committee's leadership. So that would be Gus Bauman from Beverage and Diamond is our chair and Bob Elliott from Land Team Development is our co-chair to introduce Chris. Uh, um, gentlemen, take it away. Hi, this is Gus Ballman. <clears throat> um, and I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, the uh, uh, presentation we're about to hear from Chris Conklin, um, I think everyone will find quite interesting. Um, I first met Chris many, many years ago when he headed up the Washington Regional Office for VHB, a national 
probably international, um, transportation consulting firm. But uh, Chris has been with the county government for several years and, of course, is now the director of the county department of transportation. Um, so he's responsible for everything you like and, and perhaps are frustrated with regarding transportation in Montgomery County. Now, do remember that some things are the state's responsibility, <clears throat> and Chris will be able to delineate those distinctions between state responsibility and county responsibility. Uh, but we're very pleased that uh, we're gonna be speaking with Chris today. And the way it works with these committee meetings is we begin at 8.30, we always end no later than 10 o'clock. And um, after we hear the presentation by our guests, we open this up to comments and questions from everyone on the call. So, um, you know, keep in mind um, what you may be curious about or want more information about. And uh, this is why um, we're happy to have Chris Conklin with us today. Let me turn this over to the, my vice chair, uh, Bob, um, for any comments, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Thanks. Thanks, Gus. Welcome, Chris. Uh, Bob Elliott with Lansing and Development. Um, I think uh, Gus did a great job covering Chris's career. Um, I'll probably just highlight the fact I think that uh, Chris spends a lot of his time on uh, bicycle and pedestrian safety. He's done a lot of work in the last few years with all of the, the ride-on, the flex ride-on. Flash 29, I believe, was also that. Um, obviously comes from the private sector, but also has a good sense for having been with the county now for, I think, about five or almost, maybe almost six years. Um, and just for, um, so that Gus and I can manage the flow of conversation afterwards, at the bottom of your screen, there's a little thing called reactions, and you can raise your hand down there. So if you put up your hand, we get to kind of Q&A. The other option is for you to type questions into the chat bar as things happen. That will allow uh, Chris to basically see things, but also if you'd like, we can also you know put those questions into into the mix towards the end. So with that, I will turn it over to Chris and uh, welcome Chris and we look forward to hearing from you. Okay, well, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm happy to be with you today to share a little bit about um, what's going on at MCDOT. And as Gus mentioned in the introduction. Uh, we hope we're responsible to, for the things that you're happy with and not responsible for the things you're frustrated with, but um, I'm sure there's some of each in there, and, and there are times when we wish we had control of the systems that other entities manage so that we could make changes more quickly when they are frustrating, but it is a complicated environment here in Montgomery County with municipalities being responsible for portions of the infrastructure, the county being responsible for other portions, the state or regional agencies, and even uh, in our county, federal agencies being re responsible for some of the infrastructure we all use. So um, it's, it's in that environment that we try to deliver the services our residents need and keep our infrastructure in a good state of repair. So I expect to be done kind of going through a very brief set of slides by around nine o'clock. So um, hopefully that gives plenty of time for question and answer. Um, just a little bit about Montgomery County DOT. Um, you know, we have around 1,200 employees. The vast majority of those employees are um, people who are making our transit vehicles move around the county every day or people who are actively working on um, maintaining county roads every day. Um, of that 1,200 folks, about 200 are involved in the um, planning, design, and construction of new infrastructure and the management and operation of the county's transportation system. Um, in terms of scale, we operate a little over 5,000 lane miles of road, um, which might surprise you, but I, I believe that's about the same as what Maryland State Highway Administration runs in the rest of the state. Um, we have about 500 bridges that we manage. Uh, we have the second largest transit system in the region, and aside from uh, the, the system that Charlie uh, is responsible for, um, the largest in the, in the east between uh, this area and Atlanta. Uh, there's about, this number is a little bit old, there's about 400 buses in our fleet. Um, we're hoping to have all of them be zero emission by 2035, and that's a very ambitious program that is a uh, a major focus of ours right now, and I'll spend a little bit more time on that later. Um, 
lots of bus riders, lots of bus stops in that system. Uh, in addition to that, we manage all of the traffic signals outside of a small number that are in the city of Rockville uh, for the state of Maryland. Uh, and all of that's in a centralized operations center in Gaithersburg, where we actively monitor traffic conditions and making sure all the traffic signals are working properly. If you're um, a frequent visitor of Wheaton, Bethesda, or Silver Spring, you probably use our parking facilities, uh, about 22,000 parking spaces in those central business districts, and also in a few other areas like White Flint, where we manage on-street parking and even manage some parking for private entities like Federal Realty and Pike and Rose. Uh, and then, you know, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, we're building a network of pedestrian and bicycle facilities in the county and trying to make sure they're safe uh, and adequately lit. Now that's 67,000 streetlights, about half of those are directly owned and maintained by the county and about half of those are owned and maintained by the um, electric utilities in this region. So Pepco, Baltimore Gas and Electric, um, or Potomac Edison. Uh, in terms of our budget, um, our operating budget is a little over $200 million a year. Uh, about two thirds of that is, is um, focused on our transit system um, and keeping those 800 buses running seven days a week, about 22 hours a day. Uh, about a quarter of that is focused on um, road maintenance and operations and the transportation component. And about 11% is the parking operation, which is an enterprise fund. And, and aside from um, last year during pandemic conditions is a self-supported uh, operating entity. And then in terms of the capital budget, um, we spend about $235 million each year on planning and design and construction of projects in the county. Um, they're all over the county. Um, we have about 125 active projects this year. Uh, some of the most significant ones are the Western Workaround Project, which is in the White Flint area, where Old Georgetown Road and Executive Boulevard are being realigned and Town Road is being reconstructed. The, the hardest parts of that project are behind us now um, as the convention center or conference center has been connected to Pike and Rose and most of the major utility relocations are complete. So we're hoping to have that project completed later this year. Some other major projects that are underway right now, um, we had the opening of the 355 crossing project which connects Walter Reed Medical Center and NIH in Bethesda uh, and creates a new um, tunnel and elevator system connecting to the Medical Center Metro Station. That was a long term uh, 100 or so million dollar project that was completed last year. So some of them are really big, some of them are really small. Um, many of the projects are, you know, 500 feet of sidewalk in a residential neighborhood or new traffic <coughs> signal installation. So not everything is grand. And in fact, most of the projects that we complete each year um, are incremental, small maintenance oriented projects. Uh, and you know, not the least of which are drainage uh, improvements that are uh, have been really significant over the last few years as we've had a lot of very significant storms and maintenance of infrastructure through resurfacing, um, stream restoration and other projects like that. Uh, we're focused in three different priority areas in DOT. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, and I appreciate that, uh, the, the first of those is implementing the Vision Zero program to try to eliminate serious and fatal crashes by 2030. Um, we have made some progress on this, but as you probably have seen in the last year, crash trends have not been going in a positive direction nationally. Fortunately, we haven't had quite the same uptick in Montgomery County, but we have, we have seen an increase in crashes last year. Uh, and this is an area where we really try to be um, systemic and methodical. We try not to just react to the most recent tragedy on the roads, but try to look at the data to see where the most dangerous places are and concentrate um, the investment at those locations. Uh, a second priority area for us is our climate action plan. Um, there are lots of strategies around transportation. A couple of the most significant are the implementation 
of the bus rapid transit system to try to encourage and facilitate more travel in the county being made by transit. And then a second major initiative that I'll highlight here is we are um, adapting our transportation demand management program, which has traditionally been focused on the home to work commute during peak hours to really try to capture all of the trips that residents have made and that our businesses generate and encourage the use of lower impact or low energy modes for all of those trips. So you'll see more about that in, in the executive's recommended budget. We have a couple positions for uh, travel smart ambassadors that are trying to reach out to residential communities in addition to the business community to let people know what options uh, they have available and in their choice of a car, if they're buying a car to consider a low emission or, or a zero emission vehicle so that we can achieve our objectives there and um, stop the damage we've been doing to the planet through carbon emissions. And then the third main focus area for the department is um, economic development and equitable access. And these are the major investments that we are making to improve access to our business districts and to better connect our lower income minority disadvantaged communities to the um, educational and employment and shopping and other opportunities that Montgomery County has to option has to offer and also to better connect Montgomery County to the rest of the region because we know uh, people may choose to live here but they may not be able to find a suitable job here or we may have two worker households that um, are commuting to different places for their work. So not everybody can live next to their work and we need to provide those connections so that people can travel and take advantage of everything the Washington region has to offer. Um, oh, there come the titles. See, I knew them anyway, even though they were animated. Um, we've done a lot with the transit system over the last couple of years. Um, we have four distinct brands of transit operated by the county. Um, Ride-on is the base service, which is the majority of the transit we operate. There's a, a limited stop service on Maryland 355 known as Ride-on Extra, and we've tried to use that branding to be consistent with WMATA's branding of their extra services, which are limited stop services on some of the main corridors elsewhere in the region. And there are some uh, Metro Extra services in Montgomery County, principally on New Hampshire Avenue now. So try not to uh, add additional confusion by calling the things we operate the same names. The other service that was launched last year uh, is the Flash on US 29, which is the county's first bus rapid transit project, and also the first micro transit project or service in the county, which is the Flex service, which you can either call into a call center or use an app and have the bus pick you up near your home and take you to near your destination with dynamic routing. And although we're not charging fares now, one of the innovations with this was that it was, um, you didn't have to have a credit card, you didn't have to register your, your own personal information to use the system, unlike Uber, Lyft, or other ride hailing services, you could use your smart trip um, card to access the service and then seamlessly transfer to other transit systems in the region. Uh, just a picture of the actual flash bus at the Briggs Cheney station, which is the um, furthest north that's an all day service. And a couple of the innovations with this are the all door level boarding. And you see the wheelchair um, user there. Not only do they have the ramp to access, but this has our first implementation of a wheelchair securement system where the, the passenger does not have to have the driver help them secure the wheelchair and invade their personal space while they're doing it. It's been uh, a really nice addition. And, and I, I think people are enjoying that um, freedom to get on and off the bus without uh, the assistance from the bus driver. The bus rapid transit program is moving uh, very quickly now after um, having taken quite a while to get the first service in order. Um, in the executive's recommended capital budget, we are looking to complete the design and construction of the Veers Mill Road project. Uh, to complete final design of all three of all of the 355 project, which is a 22 mile BRT, and to construct about 10 miles of that BRT within the next six years. Uh, planning has started on a couple more uh, BRT projects, New Hampshire Avenue in the East County and the North Bethesda Transit Way connecting White Flint um, to the Westfield Montgomery Mall through Rock Spring. 
and also enhancements to the US-29 service uh, uh, to provide more dedicated lanes on that. A couple other related projects, there's a Great Seneca Transit Network, which makes new connections between the Shady Grove Metro Station, the Rockville Metro Station, and the healthcare, educational, and life sciences cluster um, that's kind of between Rockville, Gaithersburg, and the universities at Shady Grove. We have a four route program there, and we're programmed for design and construction of the first two of those this year. Um, one of those will use Goody Drive and connect um, to universities at Shady Grove through the Adventist Healthcare and Falls Grove area. The other will use um, I-370 and connect to Crown Rio and then also make its way to the universities at Shady Grove where they all connect with each other. And then lastly is a bus priority program, which um, we have a number of, they're called level of effort programs, which don't have a defined scope, but are a certain amount of money that we use every year to advance the program. And this one is to look for locations um, where we can implement bus priority treatments quickly. And this marries very well with a program that um, WMATA has for a, a bus priority design. So in a couple of locations, we're coordinating with WMATA for them to design and then us to construct these improvements and other locations we're constructing them ourselves. So the first project in this program was bus lane implementation at the Germantown Transit Center. The next one will be bus lane implementation around the um, Wheaton Metro Station. And we're working with um, M.SHA to do bus lanes on University Boulevard where they implemented a bike lane pilot last year. So this is an, a, a picture that shows um, the Germantown implementation, which we were able to do um, this spring uh, and has been very successful. It, it uh, helps the buses move in and around the transit center more efficiently and without uh, interference from traffic and actually is creating a safer environment for pedestrians around that transit center as well. Um, uh, on the Vision Zero program, we have a lot of activity to protect pedestrian crossings in places where we have what you see here is known as a multiple threat scenario, where you might have like that truck may stop for a pedestrian in this crosswalk, but the car in the right lane may not. So we're looking to add protection. This is a, a Hawk signal in Aspen Hill where it will stop traffic uh, and be activated by pedestrians at a much lower cost than a full traffic signal. This is coupled with changes to the infrastructure more broadly. This is the intersection of Second Avenue uh, and Spring Street in Silver Spring, which was the first protected intersection implemented in the county. And there were some adjustments with this as it, as it got in place, people figuring out how to use it, but it's been very successful after people got used to it in the first couple months it was there. Uh, like I said, most of our um, time and energy is spent in maintaining the system. Um, our highway services crews respond whenever there's weather events, whether it's winter, summer, spring, fall, trees down, too much rain, too much snow, a forecast of snow, but no snow, whatever, whatever the scenario is, um, they respond and keep the system open and working. This year was particularly challenging for that group as we had our worst weather. We also had our highest incidence of COVID-19 infection in the department, but we managed through that and with much reduced staff availability and frankly, much reduced contractor availability because they were dealing with the same issues, managed through um, a relatively difficult January. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure in this county and a lot of it isn't in great condition. And sometimes, um, and we know about it and sometimes we don't. In this case, this is Belfast Road in Potomac. This was a culvert that we knew was in poor condition and had designs almost complete. Uh, and then in a major rain event, that culvert failed and washed out the road. Uh, and this happens every once in a while. We're usually ahead of it, but sometimes we get a weather event that, you know, outpaces our ability to repair the culverts. We have a couple that we're monitoring right now that are similar to this and hope to have the repairs done. But when this happens, in this case, we were able to reopen this road for a short period of time, allow the residents to get um, to their homes and then create uh, uh, temporary access patterns um, while this was done and it was repaired very quickly, um, but 
these are the sorts of things that we respond to in that uh, regard. When, when we have more time, we design and replace the infrastructure. This is the Park Ral uh, Valley Road Bridge and over Sligo, Sligo Creek that was reopened last year. Not everything looks as good at this, but this was in a very sensitive um, landscape, uh, historic landscape, and we replaced the bridge in similar design uh, aesthetic as to the bridge that was there before. <coughs> Excuse me, not everything we do is, um, is the road. Uh, the DOT managed the Wheaton Re Revitalization Project, which is the headquarters of the Park and Planning Commission and five other county agencies. This project was also opened in the middle of the pandemic and is really just starting to see the activity level we had planned as county and park and planning workers are, are back in their offices more regularly now. Uh, this was a very exciting project that we did in partnership with the private sector through a turnkey design build contract with Stonebridge, uh, a local, local developer and Clark Construction was the contractor. And they really delivered on this and completed uh, a massive project on time and on schedule. Um, and we're only affected in the last couple months of construction by COVID-19, but persevered and got the project open. And it's a beautiful facility and great connections into the um, Wheaton Metro Station so that it's a much more seamless environment if you're taking uh, Metro to Wheaton and patronizing other businesses in this area or conducting business with the government agencies in that building. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, Alperson Way, uh, from the ground, it doesn't look like much but there's an enormous amount of infrastructure under the ground here that uh, allowed the new high-speed elevators to make the connection to the mezzanine level at the Metro station and also the pedestrian and bike connection that's just below Maryland 355 here between NIH and Walter Reed. We're very excited that the Purple Line will resume its construction activity this spring. Um, it, particularly some of the larger projects that are funded by the county here, the Capitol Crescent Trail and the Bethesda South Entrance Project. Um, both of those were excited to see reinitiated and hopefully get completed by around 2027. Uh, and we're doing a lot with parking. Um, you know, we, we've been implementing demand-based pricing in the parking lot districts, which sets a maximum rate and allows flexibility within that rate to make sure that we're distributing the parking activity more evenly uh, between the garages and those parking lot districts. And there's an enormous amount of development interest in the parking lot district properties right now. We have two major um, projects that we expect to be able to announce relatively soon in Bethesda that will create um, significant parks, housing opportunity, uh, replacing some par surface parking lots and there's a few major projects in, um, in Silver Spring um, that, that hopefully will move forward uh, to allow expansion of some major businesses in Silver Spring and also create more housing opportunities in and around the parking lots there. But it's been a very, very busy time, more than you might have expected um, in 2020 and 2021 for redevelopment of the parking facilities in the county. Electric vehicle charging has been a focus and we are doing our first charging stations through PEPCO's um, commercial uh, charging operation that they were allowed to implement by the Public Service Commission a couple of years ago to expand charging operations. We implemented with the Department of Permitting Services new rules so that residents who don't have a driveway can um, install a charging station within the public right-of-way now and really trying to encourage and reduce the barriers to electric vehicle adoption in Montgomery County. Uh, capital bike share continues to be important. The e-bikes were added to this program uh, over the last year. If you see a black bike, it's an electric powered bike um, and it's kind of fun to use and makes it easier to get around the county using capital bike share. Um, the micro mobility scooter pilot has had its ups and downs. If you remember, I think it was 2018, we had a flood, I know Mel remembers, we had a flood of bike share bikes in Silver Spring around the Christmas holiday that um, was really unfortunate with companies trying to kind of outmatch each other and take over the market um, and use a lot of uh, investor capital to crowd out all the other competitors. 
we got through that and um, the, the scooters have become a little bit more routine in their deployment and use. And we have a couple different scooter operators, Lyft and um, I'm spacing on the other one, but they're Bird, Bird, and they're and they're working in different parts of the county and seem to be managing that much better. And it is getting significant use um, with UC 93,000 trips made the first year of that pilot. Uh, and then we are continuing things to support the community as it recovers from COVID-19, and some of these are likely to become permanent features. Um, the Bethesda Streetery on Woodmont Avenue here and also Norfolk Avenue, uh, that is probably um, the success story for the streeteries. These were managed by the Bethesda Urban Partnership or Federal Realty uh, and have really gone very well with um, not too much community disruption. We've had a couple other streeteries, one in Silver Spring on Newell Street that doesn't have a direct connection to a business sponsor. That one has been a little bit more difficult. That's an extension of a park. And one in Wheaton on Price Avenue, um, which there have been a few more noise issues with, but has been largely successful um, in Wheaton. Uh, we, like I mentioned, increasing access is important to us. This is our mobile commuter store. It's paired with the Silver Spring Transit Center commuter store and it just gives an opportunity for people to um, get passes and tickets or understand what options are available to them as they travel around and um, that's complemented by our team um, that you know has resumed hosting events around the county trying to make sure that residents can take advantage of all the transportation offerings that people have in Montgomery County and with that I was a little longer than I thought I would be I was four minutes longer but I uh Appreciate your attention and happy to answer questions you have or explore ideas that you want us to be aware of. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that was a superb overview and um, very nicely done. Let me, um, and I know that Brian and Bob will be monitoring questions coming in from the group, but let me just lead off with this basic question. Um, can you just take a moment to um, explain to the group two, two points? One would be how projects end up on your priority list, um, uh, capital projects, how, how they end up there, the, the process, you know, that that involves to get on that priority list for people who are interested in major capital projects and how long that takes and you know, where, where did the ideas come from and then how do they end up on the county list? And then connected with that question is the related question of how things work regarding projects that are county projects vis-a-vis -vis state projects, given that so many of the major roads in the county, as, as you're pointing out, Georgia Avenue, Connecticut Avenue, Rockville Pike, New Hampshire Avenue, East West Highway, these are all state highways. How that works in terms of their priorities and your priorities? Those are great questions. So I'll start with the county um, priorities, as you suggested. Um, every two years, uh, there's a full review of the county's capital improvement program. And the first step of that is um, the county executive makes a series of recommendations to the county council about what projects to do and when to do them. Um, that, that process for this cycle is wrapping up. We've had all of the work sessions with the council transportation and environment committee that gets the first crack at agreeing or disagreeing or inserting their own ideas into that process. And then those go to the county council, the full county council where sometimes there are additional changes from members who aren't part of the Transportation and Environment Committee. Um, so the life of a project in the county CIP, generally uh, a, a project is identified through a community request of some kind, whether it's um, a business related request for, for example, we've had requests to make parking changes on Old Georgetown Road in White Flint. We sometimes have uh, business requests for um, service adjustments like Adventist Medical Center in White Oak is looking to have us change bus network configuration to serve that better. If they're small items, 
often we can implement them through our level of effort activities um, without you know more planning and without a long project life cycle. If they're more significant, um, they get proposed for evaluation in the um, facility planning transportation program, which has um, it's where the county conducts planning and alternative studies for projects. Um, so one example of a project that's in that process now is at the northern end of the Shady Grove station, there's the potential for a new road connecting the Metropolitan Grove, uh, not Metropolitan Grove, Washington Grove community. Uh, and there's a series of options for either pedestrian, bike, or road connections there. And then an alternative will get selected from that and then um, identify that it should, should or shouldn't be a standalone project in the county's transportation improvement program. And another example of that is North High Street in Olney that went through the facility planning process. And there's a recommendation from council to implement that project based on the facility planning. A new program uh, was recommended this year and looks likely to be approved, which is the transportation feasibility studies. And the reason this was proposed is that facility planning process typically takes a couple years to go through and there's a backlog in that program. So it takes a few years to get to the couple years to do the study. And then when it gets out of that study, it goes into the CIP and it's typically in year five, six or beyond the six years in the CIP. So we're trying to accelerate smaller projects so that they're not at the end of a 12 year, year queue to get implemented. So that's some of that work. Um, so it's really a process. If you have an idea for a project, you would come, ideally you would come to us. You would let us know of your desire for that. If we agree that that project seems like it makes sense, we'd recommend it to the executive as part of his recommendations and it would go to council. If we don't agree and you still think it's a really good idea, you can try to work with council members um, for them to add it to their program. And our, um, our level of capital funding has really not been sufficient to implement everything that is needed in this county. So we are working with a group that involves uh, county council members, park and planning commission representatives, uh, construction industry representatives and major property owners and developers to see if there's a way we can accelerate the project delivery timeline and get a more appropriate level of funding into the county CIP. Um, I, I shouldn't complain too much. There's been quite a bit of support this year uh, because of some surpluses at the state level. So this year is looking good, like we'll be able to knock out a bunch of backlog in the CIP. But in the longer term, we think we're going to need a, a more reliable and robust funding approach for the county CIP. Um, any questions on that before I pivot to the state program? I see Lowell has his hand up. I don't know if it's a direct question on this or not. No, I'm sorry. I have another question for another matter. Okay. So please, please finish and then go so, back. Sorry. Thank sure. you. And then on the state program, um, they update their consolidated transportation program every year. Um, and that is the state's comprehensive maintenance and capital program. Um, whenever there's a significant change at the county, like a major priority has been completed, or there's a change in the composition of our elected officials, um, we update what's known as a transportation priorities letter. And that goes through a process where um, DOT will start that process and develop a draft for the executive. The executive will weigh in on whether or not the list of state or WMATA projects falls into this uh, arena as well is the right list. And then we review that list with our state um, delegation. So the um, senators and delegates from the um, Maryland House and Senate, and then the county council and finalize that list um, that the current one, I believe, was done in 2018. Uh, there has not been substantial change up till now, but we will very likely and almost assuredly be redoing that um, letter after a new council takes their seats, um, which I believe is December of this year. So it'd probably be in the spring. 
So if you have interests in any particular state program, you can find that current letter on the state website and also on our intergovernmental relations website. Um, we'll be going through that process most likely in the summer of next year, maybe the spring, summer, fall. It has to get to the state by April to inform their next CTP. I don't know whether we would kind of lay that on brand new council in their first weeks in office or if we would give them uh, you know, half a cycle to kind of understand the lay of the land before having them uh, consider that. So that that's how the state component works. Um, generally, the county projects move faster than the state projects. Even though the county projects may move slowly, they move faster than the state projects um, because the state, you know, is dealing with statewide needs and um, the projects are generally larger. So. Uh, you may see one or two of those make progress each year. The one that is most significant this year is the uh, Montgomery Hills Forest Glen reconstruction of Georgia Avenue um, to really improve that as a gateway into the Silver Spring Business District and address a lot of community disruption from the scale of that road, the kind of unsightly utilities and overhead lane controls and the pedestrian bike facilities that don't really meet current needs. So uh, that's the process for the state roads. And we work with state all the time on smaller initiatives, um, you know, minor adjustments to signing, marking, uh, crossings and things like that. Uh, that's a matter of routine, but the larger capital projects um, take longer to get implemented through uh, the priority letters process. Great, thanks. Um... Just a reminder, and Lowell was kind enough to use the, you have your hand up before Lowell, you want to ask your question. And for others, obviously type into the sidebar or throw your hand up if you've got something for you. Yeah, I'm curious, Chris. I mean, we hear so much about infrastructure issues across the country and the, uh, the lagging nature of the investment in infrastructure. I'm curious, how does Montgomery County stack up in that? Or you mentioned all the bridges that we have. Is it a, are we well uh, behind? Are we in pretty good shape? or kind of where do we stand uh, just as far as the general infrastructure in the county? Sure, um, well, I mean, that's a good question. We, I think, are probably in better shape than average, um, mostly because we have such a strong local program. Um, you know, many localities don't have a robust local program. If you hear um, conversation from other Maryland counties, um, their transportation budgets for county maintained infrastructure are much, much smaller than ours uh, and their ability to implement uh, is much lower. So we're, we're kind of blessed to have very strong local support and also Maryland DOT does a good job at maintaining infrastructure and critical infrastructure structure like bridges, even if their county projects are largely funded through the state. So. In that regard, I think we do better. Um, we have had a lot of increase in investment in infrastructure maintenance in the last 10 years. Um, it started with County Executive Leggett um, kind of recognizing the rather deplorable state of our roads and increasing the um, resurfacing rehabilitation budgets. And that has stayed the case through um, the challenges of um, in the 2010 through 2015 period and also has continued through now and we're making some progress on the backlog but part of the challenge with the infrastructure maintenance is once you're behind it's very difficult to catch up because there's a a deterioration curve and the the worse infrastructure is the faster it declines and the more expensive it is to bring it back to a state of good repair um, so we're kind of we're at a precarious place on that curve, but trying to stay on the good side of that curve where the repair strategies are more effective and less costly. And that's how we organize those, pro that, those programs. We review comprehensively the state of that infrastructure every two years, and then prioritize the repair so that we get the most bang for the buck and the dollars available in the program. So the most, the most effective lowest cost strategies are first, um, followed by sort of the more substantial reconstructions where you're getting you know, a very small number of miles repaired for the same dollars. So 
it's very it's very systematic and we do a good job um, but we're kind of in the in the edge of the curve where we're trying to keep decent infrastructure from becoming poor um, rather than um, good infrastructure becoming excellent <laughs> if that makes sense great thanks uh, any uh, else oh, Stuart you have a question Thanks. Uh, hey, Chris, uh, thanks a lot for joining us this morning. Really appreciate sure. all the information. From DOT's perspective, are we back to, generally speaking, are we back to pre-pandemic transportation demand yet? Or if not yet, uh, what's the best guess as to when we might get there? Or will we not get quite there? What? What are we seeing with the trends right now? Understanding, um, of course, that things could go sideways at any point, but. Sure. Uh, well, on the, we have better data on the transit side than the road side. Um, so in parking, uh, we are seeing that we have not recovered in the duration of stay in parking. So before the pandemic, our kind of a typical parking session in one of the PLDs during the week would be a six to seven hour parking stay, which you can equate to somebody working in the workplace for most of the day. Right now we're at about a three hour average. So people are not spending as much time there, which makes us think, although we don't have any conclusive evidence about what they're doing, but makes us think that it's more shopping, dining oriented or partial day in the office work. Um, the, the overall parking levels are kind of like 70% of what they were heading into COVID-19. Um, so still quite a ways below uh, what we were seeing before. And, and that's good and bad. It's reducing the pressure on the facilities, allowing you know, repair and maintenance work to happen without the disruption that you might've seen otherwise. Um, but at the same time, it's starving us of the revenue to do that work. So. Um, it's, it's interesting on the parking side. On the transit side, we're also kind of around 70% of the pre-pandemic ridership. Um, and here's what I would say about those travel patterns on transit and on the highways. They are not in the same pattern. Um, in the pan, be, before the pandemic, we would have a morning peak that was severe, but not generally horrible in this county, we would and we would have an afternoon peak that was horrible. And none of us, I think, now quite remember how bad it was, because when we sit in a little bit of traffic now, we say, oh, it's back. No, it's, it's not back. It's nowhere near what it was. Um, but what we have seen um, from data uh, that's a little bit old now, it's probably six or eight months old, uh, the midday period is higher than it was before. So uh, I think that the telework trend and the more flexible work situations that people have are with us to stay and probably forever. And that's a good thing. That's actually something we, you know, from 1980 to 2019, we were encouraging employers to adopt those things to reduce the pressure on those peaks. And that's, I think, what's happened. So I don't think we will ever see exactly what we saw before. I think we will see more consistent travel throughout the day and less pronounced morning and evening peaks. Um, but as the region grows, um, whatever slack that created will get consumed. Uh, the only thing that would stop that is, you know, economic downturn and people deciding they don't want to live in the Washington region anymore. And that's not an outcome anybody wants. Um, so that's why we're continuing our transportation demand management efforts to try to keep people in transit or encourage them to adopt transit again as they establish a new work pattern so that we don't end up overtaxing the roads as quickly as we would if everybody drove every trip just because we were able to for a couple of years. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, any other questions at the moment? Gus, you previously sounded like you had something you might wanted to ask. Did you not have anything um, more? Otherwise, I can. I was. Um, I'm curious about the streeteries personally. Um, you know, I have had experience with the Bethesda one. My office is in Bethesda. Um, I think it's a double-edged sword. I think it's great from a dining perspective. I think 
candidly, I think it's a total nightmare for moving across Bethesda. Just, I've, I've just, are we seriously thinking about keeping them permanently? At least the one on Woodmont Avenue. I, that's the hardest one. Um, you know, Norfolk Avenue is not the traffic artery that Woodmont Avenue. Not was. at all. Not not at all. <laughs> um, but the Woodmont Avenue one has kind of been the most popular uh, for dining. So we haven't made any formal decision on that, but I think we are likely to reconsider that street no matter what, to have more outdoor dining activity, even if it reopens for traffic. Um, so retailers won't like it, but I mean, taking parking lane, taking the parking spaces back, but with what we're storing traffic flow, um, if people willing to sit that close, you know, you put, you know, concrete barriers in the parking lanes or something so that you can have an extra what is it, 10, 11 feet. The other thing I would ask is there's the stub street that's um, still blocked because of the purple line. Um, yeah. that, and I know that that's access to a garage and a bunch of other stuff, but it seems to me that street is, and there's loading docks over there too, so it's not the sexiest street in the world, but it just seems to me there might be an opportunity over there. To me, it's about traffic flow. And it, admittedly, it's probably a couple times a day, right? It's the morning and the evening, just the ability to go through Bethesda. I think it puts too much pressure on almost every single light. And by the way, there's so much traffic construction going on in Bethesda right now. I don't know what's yours versus all the, the contractors, but it's a it's a slalom going through Bethesda right yeah. now. If you're on Wisconsin, if you're on East West, if you're um, just both good and bad. I just I wonder what's gonna happen when people actually arrive back in Bethesda. I don't know if you guys yeah. are giving a lot of thought because when we actually well, get I, the capacity, it's gonna be oh. and we'll have the Marriott um, headquarters yeah. occupancy upon us very soon, which will bring a, maybe not as many as they thought every day, but certainly a significant additional daytime population there. Most of the construction is private construction in Bethesda. Our active projects are kind of done. Uh, the, the Bethesda Avenue cycle track, and there's a little bit more work to do on the Woodmont Avenue cycle track, but it's not heavy long-term construction on that. So most of what you see is to, is um, building construction related. Um, in terms of opening Woodmont Avenue, I think, you know, we need to have a, a broader conversation about what the right approach to that is um, that involves people like you that are interested in the, the traffic flow and those who are advocating for it to be restaurant space all the time. And there probably is a, a happy medium that allows the traffic flow uh, and an improved dining situation. Because there are issues with the way that's set up now in terms of fire lane, the bike travel through it, accessibility, um, water-filled barrels are not a long, or water-filled barricade is not a long-term strategy. Um, it doesn't create the kind of look and feel that people want there either. So um, there's no decision there. It's gonna be closed through the summer for dining like it is now. And um, we're starting a little bit of work in house to think about what are the options for the longer term. Um, but I know, you know, Gwen Wright, for example, doesn't think it should be closed forever either um, because you know, it just creates more traffic pressure elsewhere. And a grid is a better way to deal with traffic than a few large streets and that we had the option for a grid in Bethesda with Woodmont, Wisconsin and the cross streets. And Elm Street will be closed for quite a long time uh, now that the purple line is getting back underway. So um, it does access the parking garage, but it won't be a through street probably until 2027. Questions, comments from... Hey, Charlie has his hand up. I don't know if we'll be yeah. able to hear him. But can, can you hear me can. now? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. Um, yeah. So, so I was interested in the zero emission bus. Um, the county is much more aggressive than Metro is. So we actually we appreciate that because we like to see others testing out technologies. Um, but just wondering. So by 2035, if you're 100 percent zero emission, that basically means all the buses you're buying, any new buses today, would probably be zero emission. So is that what you're doing? And then a Another question we're looking at is also uh, energy sources. So we're looking at uh, the electricity that we procure. Should we be uh, ramping up our renewable energy you know, standards for electricity purchases? And is that you guys or is that DGS? 
It's a combination, Charlie. Um, we, we work on this issue in partnership with them. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Department of General Services manages the county fleet and we're their client um, for buses. So uh, the CIP or the capital improvement program where the dollars are are ours, but they actually do the procurement of the vehicles. Um, so yeah, we, we made the decision without, not without agony in around 2020 that we weren't buying any more conventionally fueled buses. So we got our last delivery of those probably in early 2020. Um, we are not not retiring the buses at the rate we normally would because we're still working on the strategy of how the zero emission gets worked into the fleet. We did some analysis and figured out about half of our routes were supportable by the current battery electric technology, half are not um, because they're too long. They, the range The range of the vehicles is shorter than the length of the daily drive for the for the route. Um, so what we've done is the Department of General Services has done a, a microgrid P3 project at our Silver Spring Depot, where there's a solar array, a backup natural gas generating station, um, and battery storage on site so that we can charge up to 70 vehicles there, and then it's expandable. It's also grid connected. Uh, and the county is a purely uh, renewable purchaser. You know, an electron is an electron, but they pay a differential to encourage um, green production of energy. Um, and we know we can get to that point. And that's what we're working on now is filling up that microgrid. And then it gets a little less clear from there. And we have a strategic planning effort underway that we're leading in working with DGS to figure out how to complete the fleet transition. One of the things that we're applying for in this cycle of federal grant opportunities is hydrogen fueling. Um, we would like to install a hydrogen fueling depot at our Gaithersburg depot where the longer routes are housed. And for those of you who aren't familiar, um, you use water and solar energy or grid energy to create hydrogen, which is stored at a low temperature. But the nice thing about it is it's fuelable like gas or like diesel. It's a five minute fuel and you can refuel continuously through the day and keep the bus running. Um, whereas, you know, you're not parking a bus for four to six hours to build the charge or installing in route charging infrastructure at four or $500,000 per location. Um, so we're, we're excited that hydrogen is part of the mix and think it probably needs to be. There aren't any hydrogen fueled systems on the East Coast. There's one in Illinois, there's one in California. So we would be the first in the East Coast to try that out. Um, and in the longer term, there's the desire to generate the hydrogen from um, landfill methane, because right now that's kind of a waste gas that's going into the atmosphere. You could at least capture that and you're gonna still have some carbon emission, but you're dramatically reducing a carbon emission that's already happening and would happen otherwise without the strategy. And methane to hydrogen is a, a more efficient way to generate hydrogen because if you think back to your high school chemistry, you've got H2O or CH4. So you're getting four hydrogens per molecule rather than two. Um, and it's a little bit um, easier to do. It doesn't have quite the same energy requirement. So it's not, I don't think it will all be battery electric at the end of the day. And I, I would say we know how to do about a third of what we've said we're gonna do and we don't know how to do the other two thirds. Okay. Um, other questions, comments? Uh, Bob, if I could just ask one more question, I apologize. Go for it, I'm, 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 curi I'm curious um, on your, your budget, how much of your budget is funded by riders or users of parking facilities, that type of thing? How much uh, comes from the, you know, from the That's actual users of your services? So in parking facilities, which is about a little over 10% of our budget, it's 100% from users. Now I say that there was a, a problem in 2020 
because of um, we weren't meeting our bond coverage requirements in Bethesda, so the county paid for some of that in 2020, but otherwise it's 100% self-funded. Um, the road component of our program is 100% tax supported. So there's no user fee element to the road program. And on transit, it's been largely federal aid supported for the last two years. Um, so county tax plus federal aid, traditionally it's about a 20 to 25% um, fair supported budget. And there's a county mass transit tax that had made up the other component of that budget. In 2020, 2021, and into 2022, we had very significant COVID related federal aid um, that, that filled the budget hole that we otherwise had. So none of it is, aside from parking, heavily user, user funded. Chris, real quick, the corridor forward plan uh, looks to be adopted imminently. Do you have any particular uh, today, specific today. date? What's that? I think it's today. Is it today? I believe so. <laughs> Glad I asked. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, we, we work closely with planning to try to get that into a place that both agencies were comfortable with. We are less bullish on some of their long-term ideas than they are, but, um, and I know Charlie, this agency is less bullish on some of their long-term ideas than they are as well. But nonetheless, I, th I think it's slated for them to adopt it, I think in the session today. Thanks. Chris, this is Gus again. Uh, question, um, you had made reference in your presentation to the um, long planned Georgia Avenue improvement project between the Capitol Beltway moving south to 16th Street in Silver Spring. Um, and as you know, as you indicated, it's been in the plans for, well, decades um, to improve the, both the look and the, the use of that corridor. So it's not so grim uh, to use the word. Um, because that's a state highway, because it's gonna require the state um, to take on the, the larger share of that program. What are you seeing from the county perspective about when that might actually take place after all the years of planning and, and, and discussion and debate? It's been a very long time as you know so well, but it seems to be in the hands more of the state than the county. Um, I mean, is the county still pushing it as a priority? And, yeah. And what do you see? Sure. It's our number one priority for state highways in, in the current letter. And if they don't make more progress, I suspect it'll be number one in the next letter. Um, they are actively working on it. Unlike if we'd had this conversation three years ago, I don't think we would say they were actively working on it. They are. They're looking at the right-of-way needs. They're looking at the utility relocation requirements. They're in um, kind of wrapping up their preliminary engineering components and, and working on the right-of-way phase. So they're moving. Um, it will be an extended construction project. If it does move forward, they're going to have a couple years of, I'll call it enabling work, where they're getting conduit installed and getting it ready so that they can move the utilities and that's, it's always shocking for our Western workaround project. It was a three year time period to move the telecommunications lines. And that's the sort of experience that we'll have on that project. So there'll be a lot of kind of nuisance work that will take a couple years and then they'll be able to work on the surface. So my guess is that we're looking at that project being completed in six to eight years and I, I suspect they might find the money, although I can't be sure, um, in the current budget to begin moving it more earnestly forward. Um, you know, we're seeing significant surplus at the state level, and that's providing a fair amount of funding support to us, and I suspect the state DOT will find a way to get some of their projects that have been languishing funded through that 
uh, uh, funding availability also. So it's looking better than it ever has, Gus, in terms of actually getting that done. But nonetheless, it's not a sure thing. Right, right. Well, thank you for that. It's It's been in the plan since the 70s, as yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> so trying to convert that seven lanes of pavement to a boulevard concept will be painful, but I think everyone's willing to go through the pain. Right. Thank you. And there will be less traffic capacity when it's done than there is now. So it will have to, we have to accept that if we want the project. Well, candidly, it sits literally between two metro stations. So, right. right it will only, I would think, encourage more ridership for Charlie Scott's system. Thank you. Chris, on behalf of the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce and our Infrastructure and Land Use Committee, thank you so much for joining us and spending so much time with us this morning. Um, well, it was a really pleasure. I know, I know Leslie's gone, but it's, and I know Leslie and I know Gus the best, and I know Stuart also, but good to see so many familiar faces here. Um, I should apologize for it being so long. No, no, you, no, um, no, no, you were not. You are not wrong. In fact, you are the briefest speaker we have had. Oh, <laughs> and, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, since we've talked, I, we haven't talked probably since 2018. Um, but but you're, no, you, you were not wrong. The okay. presentation was concise and very informative. Um, it truly was. It's a very good presentation. Good. Okay, well, I appreciate the opportunity and I'm happy to come back. If there's anything on your agenda that you think is worthy of a conversation, happy to engage with you whenever that happens. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, uh, Gus and Bob, I don't know if you have any last words before we uh, we end the meeting, but again, um, Chris, thank you so much for spending so much time with us today. And we really appreciate the discussion and the presentation. Thank you. All right, have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, everyone.